that's the one. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm late. Um, is everybody here? Do I start? Or what is the story? Sorry, just bear with me. All right, uh, welcome uh, to this session, session 3B. It's a concurrent breakout session for the private sector. Uh, and we have four eminent speakers who will be talking to us about contracting with foreign parties and cross-border dispute resolution. Our first uh, speaker today is Kevin. Kevin, um, Kevin, who is Kevin Nash, who is the Deputy Registrar and Centre Director for the Singapore International Arbitration Centre. He's been there for the past decade and has administered thousands of international cases under all versions of the SIAC rules and uh, the UNCITRAL rules. He's a member of the Singapore delegation at the UNCITRAL Working Group and represents SIAC as an observer at the UNCITRAL Working Group 3. Um, as, you, um, as many of you will know, uh, SIAC is one of the world's major arbitration centers. He's a, Kevin is a Canadian and is qualified as a barrister and solicitor uh, with the Law Society of Upper Canada. Uh, an interesting fact about him is he's a former athlete and learned how to ice skate as soon as he could walk. As a bit of a contradiction, he's an avid fly fisher and scuba diver, but doesn't like to eat fish. Ladies and gentlemen, Kevin. Thank, th thank you, John. Uh, it's great to be here. I should point out that my ice skating is not very useful in Singapore, where it's 31 degrees every day, but no complaints about being away from the cold. Uh, I have been uh, asked today and very happy to speak about arbitration versus litigation. I think that uh, it's important for us to be humble as arbitration professionals, and certainly me working at an institution, is that there is no one way of doing things. It is horses for courses. Uh, when you look at arbitration versus litigation, it's not really a binary choice, and often these will go together. Parties who are involved in arbitration uh, will often need the support of the courts. So if you need to enforce an award, if you need certain relief during the course of the arbitration proceeding, uh, there might be the requirement to go to court. There are also a lot of other options beyond arbitration and litigation. There is negotiation. At any time, parties should be considering the possibility, can we negotiate this dispute? Is it necessary to escalate uh, to a form of dispute resolution? Mediation is becoming popular, particularly in Asia Pacific, where there's a culture of conciliation. There's neutral evaluation, expert determination, adjudication, uh, hybrid options. All of these are possible. And really, what you have to ask yourself in a transaction is what is best for your contract? What is the bargaining power between the parties? Is this a long-term relationship uh, that it's important to preserve? Is the eventual quantum of the dispute known? Can you predict what is the value of the potential dispute? And where are the parties from in terms of different legal cultures? Uh, Brenda will be talking about the, the costs and duration of arbitration and, and these different forms of procedures, but I like to look at it almost like a continuum. So at one side, in terms of the lowest time and costs, you will probably have mediation, expert determination. Uh, and then as you move along, you will go to arbitration. And most of the institutions will have fast track procedures. So you can get a very quick arbitration. At SIC, we have an expedited procedure where you can have an award in six months. As you move along this continuum, then the cost and duration will tend to get a bit higher. Uh, the cost will be higher in your home jurisdiction, but if you have to go to litigation, <clears throat> excuse me, in a foreign jurisdiction, then perhaps uh, even higher from there. Looking at it from the landscape and through the lens of Singapore, <clears throat> what, we, what we've tried uh, to do in Singapore is really be a place where any kind of dispute can be resolved. And there's three pillars to this. So we have international arbitration. And international arbitration in Singapore is much bigger than just SIC. There are six major administering institutions. <clears throat> so there's the SIC, PCA, we have Fidelma with us today, ICC, ICDR, WIPO, the Singapore Chamber of Maritime Arbitration. There's also a robust ad hoc regime. 
So that's the international arbitration component. We also have international mediation. So there's the Singapore International Mediation Center. I'm sure many of you would be aware of the Singapore Convention on Mediation that is now providing for the enforceability of mediated agreements. And we also have international litigation where there's the Singapore International Commercial Court, which is the div division of the High Court. So if you want international litigation in Singapore before a bench of international jurists, you can choose to go to the Singapore International Commercial Court. What's quite interesting about these transactions when parties are deciding between arbitration and litigation is that there is a term known as the midnight clause, that the dispute resolution choice is the very last thing that's decided in the contract. But it's also very important. That's why we're, it's very good to have Jonathan here today who will be talking about drafting arbitration clauses. Because certainly we will see a lot of clauses at SIC where perhaps the parties have not been able to make that choice between arbitration and litigation. There could be contradictory terms within the clause where the parties have pro provided for both arbitration and litigation. There could be an arbitration clause where there's a unilateral election where one party is able to choose to go to arbitration or litigation. And depending on where the eventual place of enforcement is, this could cause problems down the road. As I continue to kind of blend and juxtapose certain features of arbitration and litigation and show how they complement each other, what's been interesting about the development of arbitration is that there are certain features in litigation that are being imported into arbitration. Most sets of institutional rules now have provisions for joinder and consolidation. This used to be a weakness of arbitration. This idea that if you had five separate contracts, you might have need to have five separate arbitrations. Now there's the possibility of collapsing those five arbitrations into a single proceeding. Same thing as joining uh, an additional party, uh, a party, uh, a non-signatory to the contract. It's now possible in certain circumstances to join that party to the arbitration. SIC also introduced a provision for the early dismissal of claims and defenses. What this is, is really taking the common law litigation feature of summary judgment and striking out and bringing this into arbitration. This has been a very attractive feature of litigation, this idea that you can strike out certain claims or get a quick decision. Now this is possible in arbitration as well. So let's look at when you might decide to go to arbitration and how you're deciding on this choice. One of the, one of the perhaps easiest ways is to look at what is the matter of the dispute? Is this something that is arbitrable? Can the parties agree to take this to arbitration? For instance, if it was a dispute uh, involving family law, patrimonial property rights, life and health, things like these are probably not arbitrable. So you're not able to agree to go to arbitration. If you're looking at some of the advantages of litigation, in litigation, you're more likely to get a decision based in the law. Uh, in court, uh, the conduct is uh, established by governed rules of evidence. Uh, whereas in arbitration, the arbitrator has considerable flexibility to use any evidence that the arbitrator deems relevant and may make a decision on perceptions of fairness, equity, and not necessarily on evidence or rules of law. The right of appeal uh, is something that is present uh, in litigation and sometimes viewed as an, as an advantage. But the question is, how valuable is this right of appeal? What are the standards of review for the appeal? in that jurisdiction? Will this appellate process uh, now increase the cost and duration of the proceedings? If you look at litigation, one thing the courts have that arbitrators do not is uh, really the powers of coercion and imperium. There can be criminal sanctions and parties tend to be compelled to comply with judgments. In the alternative in arbitration, uh, parties may have to take that arbitration award and have it enforced in court. One thing that has been fairly advantageous in the SIC re regime is that parties tend to, tend to voluntarily comply with arbitration awards, uh, but there is not that same threat of crim criminal sanctions and imperium and coercion that you have in litigation. The openness to the public of public court proceedings, that can be perceived as an advantage, this is something that arbitration is looking at, looking at the transparency of proceedings. The openness of litigation also creates uh, precedent. So courts are following previous decisions and will be bound to follow certain uh, decisions. So if you have 
uh, a first instance first instance court uh, will be following this and then it's also subject to appeal. That doesn't exist in the same way in arbitration, but arbitration is making some important moves to increase the transparency and the availability of decisions. We see this particularly in investor state arbitration. Litigation also provides for broader discovery and the potential for third party discovery. discovery. This is in common law jurisdictions primarily. So you can obtain information from the other side in the form of documents and verbal res responses through a process called uh, document discovery. This allows you to identify the strengths and weaknesses of the opposing party's case and give you access to information that might not be available through other forms of dispute resolution. Discovery is an interesting uh, concept in arbitration because this is something that arbitration tends to eschew to a certain degree. It is somewhat disfavored uh, in international arbitration, and instead, in arbitration, you will have uh, prepared witness statements as a substitute for a protracted discovery process. We are starting to see uh, more robust discovery in arbitration, and this is something that will tend to increase the time and cost of the proceedings. Interim relief may be easier to obtain in litigation, and particularly ex parte relief. So at SIC and under the SIC rules, there's the possibility for the appointment of an emergency arbitrator. Prior to the constitution of the tribunal, if a party needed urgent interim relief, say to restrain a call on a bond, you can apply for the appointment of an emergency arbitrator. But this is not ex parte interim relief. Uh, based on my understanding, uh, there's very few institutions, and the only one that occurs to me is the Swiss Chambers that allows ex parte uh, emergency arbitration. So if you need ex parte uh, interim relief, court may be uh, an interest or a, a reasonable choice. One thing that is kind of interesting about Singapore is the compatibility of urgent relief to the court in the context of parties that have agreed to an arbitration clause. The way the Singapore International Arbitration Act positions it is that you can make an application to the court, even if you have an ar arbitration uh, agreement on the basis that the institution is unable to act effectively. So if you needed that ex parte relief, or if you needed an order against a third party, even when you've agreed to an arbitration clause, you could go to the curial court, that's the court of the seat of arbitration, and obtain interim relief. There's also choice of law uh, issues to consider when you're deciding between arbitration and, and litigation. What law should apply? Do you want to have the law of the site of, say, the project, the law of one of the parties, the law of the financing entities, or a neutral neutral law? Uh, if it's not really reasonably related to the dispute, even if the parties have agreed, courts in litigation may disregard this choice of law, whereas in arbitration there may be a complex intersection of laws that are agreed by the parties. So the parties could agree on the seat of arbitration, and that will govern the procedure. They can agree on the substantive law of the contract, how the arbitrator is going to decide what law the arbit arbitrator is going to, going to apply. And then also the law governing the arbitration agreement, how the arbitrator is going to interpret whether or not the arbitration agreement itself, separate from the contract, uh, is uh, valid uh, and existing. Perhaps the most important point that we'll be discussing in this session is the enforceability and portability of court judgments. So if you get a court judgment in one jurisdiction, how do you take it to another jurisdiction? So there may be a reciprocal arrangement uh, between the countries, but in arbitration, you now have 167 uh, countries that have signed up to the New York Convention that will enforce these arbitral awards save in uh, limited circumstances. One thing that has been particularly relevant as we're moving uh, through the pandemic is the advantage of arbitration uh, with remote hearings. What happened at the beginning of the pandemic in some jurisdictions is that it was very difficult uh, to be able to get court proceedings. Arbitration has done very well by adopting remote uh, technology and is less impacted by COVID-19. And there's a variety of reasons for this. Uh, these are some of the advantages, surely, that Fidelma will be talking about, but it's the flexibility of the arbitration rules that allow the parties to customize the arbitral process. The parties could agree to a documents-only procedure where no hearing is needed or a fully remote hearing, and this is what we're seeing at SIC. So there's 
real use of technology, video conferencing, and virtual hearings. You also get the... Can you round up, please, Kevin? Sorry, we're, we're running out of time, so if we could just round up the four questions. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, in my rush, because I was late, I forgot to say you can uh, send questions through the chat facility that we'll ask each speaker at the end, and hopefully at the end of the whole session, there will also be time for questions. So, Kevin, uh, if you could just round up before some questions. Uh, Thanks, John. I, I, I believe that SIC is always on time, so I think I'm just under time, but I must commit to, to staying on that because that is the tradition of SIC. I mean, I guess the real question is to just be uh, consider the circumstances of this dispute. Not every system of dispute resolution uh, works for every transaction. So arbitration, litigation, other forms of ADR, these can all be appropriate in certain circumstances and just pay particular attention uh, to the drafting. But uh, John, certainly happy to ask, answer questions from you or the audience. All right. If I could just start off, you mentioned something about appeals and the difference between arbitration and litigation in terms of appeals. Could I just ask you to expand on what you, you, you spoke about? Is there a standard a right to appeal in arbitration? Uh, yeah, yeah. There's, so there's not a standard right, and that's typically viewed as an advantage. Uh, in the Singapore domestic framework, there's the possibility of an appeal on a point of law. Uh, same thing, say, under the English Arbitration Act. So for most parties, the lack of this appellate mechanism, the fact that this decision is final, is a big advantage of arbitration because the appellate process in litigation can take a significant amount of time and add to those time and costs. Okay, so, uh, you know, to help set the stage for what Brenda is going to be discussing later on, do you have any sort of brief thoughts on the comparative costs and the duration of arbitration versus litigation? If you, if you, if you look at the cost for arbitration and litigation, the high, highest costs are actually, are actually the legal fees. And there is a direct relationship, uh, to, to timing costs. In general, what arbitration has done, uh, across all the institutions is introduce features to m try to make arbitrations conclude more quickly. And with the lack of an appellate mechanism and procedures to make the arbitration conclude more quickly, which will, uh, lessen costs, uh, then arbitration should have an advantage there. I, I would like to add the one feature that uh, is important to note is that there is a transnational tradition in, in arbitration uh, that costs follow the event. So if a cl claimant is substantially successful in all of its claims and the costs claimed are reasonable, it is absolutely possible for the arbitrator to award 100% of those costs. In litigation, you may be on a cost schedule or it may be the tradition in that jurisdiction that each side is to bear its own costs. So this ability to get all of your costs back is another advantage of arbitration. All right, thank you very much. Um, and my last question is, you're an arbitrator. Can I ask you to be objective and honest here? What are the weaknesses of arbitration for cross-border disputes? Uh, that's... A that's that's a great question. I think that uh, arbitration, say, uh, 10 years ago, was starting to become uh, somewhat protracted uh, and expensive. Uh, as, as I was mentioning earlier, arbitration has gotten really honest with itself and realized that we must make these these proceedings go expeditiously and really look at time, time and cost. Uh, so I think that was the weakness of arbitration. It had branded itself as this fast way to get cheap justice, but then was starting to be a bit more like litigation. And I think every time there's an improvement in arbitration, it is going back to these fundamentals. We're going to the first principles of arbitration, that it's fast, that it's cost effective. You can choose your decide decider. It's customizable, enforceable, enforceable lim limited avenues of appeal. Well, everything that we're doing is to get back to those principles. All right. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, I will now, we'll now go to uh, our next speaker. Um, and next we have uh, Fidelma Smith. Uh, Fidelma is a senior legal counsel at the Permanent Court of Arbitration, the PCA in The Hague. She recently spent a three-year period as the PCA's first rep in Singapore and was the founder of the Singapore office. Um, 
She was the founder of the Singapore office. And um, Fidelma has previously represented the PCA in Mauritius. She's originally a barrister from the UK and has previously worked as a law clerk at the ICJ. So Fidelma will be talking to us uh, today about the advantages of arbitration, speed, expertise, neutrality, and enforcement. Welcome, Fidelma. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you all right now. Um, I'll so I'm... And don't forget, if you have any questions, ladies and gentlemen, please put them in the chat for Fidelma at the end. Sorry, Fidelma. Yes, thank you. So I'm going to unpack four of the key intended benefits of arbitration, speed, expertise, neutrality, and enforcement. And I'll go straight to speed. Um, so agreeing on arbitration can save time and uncertainty because it centralizes the dispute resolution forum. And this avoids protracted disputes in and between national courts over issues like jurisdiction, forum selection, choice of law, evidence, and recognition of foreign judgments. And it also minimizes the risk of inconsistent decisions. As Kevin has already elaborated upon, arbitration typically does not involve appellate review, save in limited circumstances. Thus, arbitration can avoid the delay, which is inherent in appellate proceedings, and reduces the risk of having to start again if an initial trial court decision is reversed on appeal. Arbitration proceedings can be expedited. So arbitration can be contrasted with litigation also because national courts might be overburdened and final decisions in some jurisdictions could take years or longer. In an arbitration, the parties have more control. Typically, the tribunal, uh, once constituted in an arbitration, will consult with the parties at the outset of a case on the timetable for written pleadings and hearings, if any. Where appropriate, the tribunal might decide the case without a hearing. And discovery or document production procedures are typically limited. Where time is of the essence, the parties can draft a fast track arbitration clause, or they can have recourse to institutions who have done this work for them. A number of institutions have adopted fast track or expedited procedural rules for small value disputes and disputes requiring urgent consideration. These permit resolution in a matter of months, typically by a sole arbitrator in expedited proceedings. A number of arbitral institutions also provide for early dismissal or of claims or defences. And SIAC is a leading example in the Asia Pacific region of an institution which has taken these steps. So it is entirely within the party's control to tailor the process to their needs as to speed, um, notably while drafting the arbitration clause. Now I'll turn to expertise. Arbitration is typically favoured by commercial and other users because it offers a more expert and experienced means of dispute resolution. And this is achieved mostly through the party's participation in the selection of the arbitral tribunal. So the parties to a transaction are the ones who have the most intimate knowledge of their relationship and their disagreements should they arise. And arbitration enables parties to select the adjudicators or the qualifications that adjudicators should have to secure the best experience and abilities for their particular dispute. And once a dispute has arisen, a party can exercise this freedom of choice and tailor their choice of person chosen to the dispute. Alternatively, they can include certain characteristics in the requirements of who the arbitrator should be in the arbitration clause, for example, requiring admission to a particular uh, legal system or expertise or experience in a particular industry. This can be contrasted in particular with litigation. It may be the case, depending on the location, that local state courts have little uh, experience in complex international transactions. Or, and of course, um, that is not an absolute 
uh, role because, of course, uh, many national judiciaries include judges of very considerable expertise. But in general, judges are generalists and uh, they may not be specialised in the type of transaction uh, that's before them. And in a given dispute, the judge will be selected by operation of the court system, not by the parties themselves. And uses of arbitration frequently refer to this ability to select the tribunal themselves as one of the most uh, substantial benefits of arbitration. So again, the ability to tailor the process to their needs. Third, I turn to neutrality. This is one of the central advantages for arbitration. It provides a neutral forum for dispute resolution, which is detached from the parties or their respective home states. Now, in an international dispute, the local courts of one party will be convenient and familiar to the hometown party, but may be somewhat inconvenient and unfamiliar to the other party. In these circumstances, the typical practice is to seek agreement on a neutral forum. Uh, and arbitration offers this. An essential part of the neutrality of arbitration further is in the composition of the arbitral tribunal. And as I've mentioned, arbitration permits the parties to play a role in selecting the members of the tribunal. This may include either a sole arbitrator or a panel of three with a presiding arbitrator whose nationality is almost always different from either of the parties involved. Once more, the parties can tailor this part of the process to their needs. And how is this neutrality safeguarded? Well, arbitration rules of procedure typically include a requirement that any prospective arbitrator actively confirms that she or he is independent and impartial vis-a-vis -vis the parties to the dispute. And they will also typically include a mechanism for challenging an arbitrator on grounds of conflict of interest. Neutrality is also a feature of arbitration through the use of internationally neutral procedures and rules. Um, in international transactions, there is a special need for freedom from unfamiliar local standards and requirements. And national courts apply local procedural rules, which may be unfamiliar to foreign parties. So international arbitration seeks to apply procedures that are rooted in a mix of legal traditions, and these can be tailored to the party's needs in a particular type of dispute. Um, so for example, the PCA, Permanent Court of Arbitration, arbitration rules adopted in 2012 are tailored to disputes where at least one party is a state, state entity or intergovernmental organization. And fourth, but by no means least, enforcement. This is a central attraction of international arbitration. Um, that the enforcement of the agreement to arbitrate and the award is more reliable. Uh, now, in general, our international arbitration agreements are more readily and more expeditiously enforced with fewer exceptions than forum selection clauses. So that's the contrast with litigation. And as Kevin has already mentioned, this is thanks to the New York Convention which as of today has 167 states parties and the existence of national arbitration legislation, which generally takes a pro enforcement approach. And this legal framework facilitates the enforceability of arbitration agreements. Generally, forum selection clauses don't benefit from anything which is comparable to the New York Convention. Now, international arbitration awards, the end result of the process, also enjoy the protection of the New York Convention. And the procedure for the recognition and enforcement of an international award is relatively straightforward. Enforcement may be refused on limited grounds only. In contrast with this, there are only a few regional arrangements for the enforcement of foreign judgments, and there is no global counterpart to the New York Convention as of now. Um, so in the absence of international treaties, recognition of foreign judgments in many countries is subject to local law. So there is generally a significantly greater likelihood that an international arbitral award 
will be enforced abroad and actually bring an end to the dispute than a national court judgment will do. So, um, in other words, this final benefit of international arbitration is that it brings finality. Um, so, thank you very much, John. Those are the remarks that I had prepared. I'd be delighted to, to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fidelma. Um, I'll lead off with a question. Um, you talked about arbitrators being required to be independent and impartial. You talked about the ability to challenge uh, somebody who you thought might not be impartial. What are the remedies if you challenge? What sort of remedies could you seek? So a party wishing to challenge an arbitrator can have recourse to the challenge mechanism under the agreed procedural regime. So for example, in a case under the PCA Arbitration Rules 2012, have a copy here, um, a party can challenge an arbitrator on grounds of, quote, circumstances that give rise to justifiable doubts as to the arbitrator's impartiality or independence. And the procedure for bringing such challenge is to give notice of the challenge and the reasons on which it's based to the tribunal and the other party. And then the other party and the challenged arbitrator will have the chance to make comments on the challenge. What happens next is that the, um, the challenged arbitrator may resign or may decide not to resign. And if the challenged arbitrator does not resign and the party maintains the challenge, then the challenge will be decided by the appointing authority. Under the PCA arbitration rules, the appointing authority is the secretary general of the PCA. And the standard to be applied is whether the appointing authority considers that there are circumstances that give rise to justifiable doubts as to the arbitrator's impartiality or independence. So if an arbitrator resigns or is removed uh, by the appointing authority upholding the challenge, then a replacement arbitrator is to be appointed by the same method as the appointment of the arbitrator who's being replaced, and then the arbitration continues. Okay, thanks, Adelma. We just got a couple of minutes left. Um, we don't have any questions yet from the audience. Don't forget, you can ask questions in the chat function at the bottom. Uh, but could I just ask you one question very quickly? You also mentioned that enforcement of an arbitral award can be refused on only very limited grounds. What briefly are those grounds? Well, um, so there are seven grounds listed in Article 5 of the New York Convention. Um, and the first five are grounds which can be invoked by the party who's resisting enforcement. And those are largely based on due process. So um, that the parties to the arbitration agreement were under some incapacity or the agreement was not valid. Uh, that there was failure to give proper notice of the arbitration proceedings or the appointment of the arbitrator, that a party was unable to present its case, um, that the award of the tribunal deals with a difference not contemplated by the submission to arbitration, so excess of jurisdiction, or the composition of the tribunal or the procedure was not uh, in accordance with the party's agreement, um, and the fifth ground is that the award has not yet become binding or the award has been set aside uh, or suspended in uh, by a court in the place of arbitration. And then there are two further grounds and those can be applied by a court of its own motion. And those are firstly that the subject matter is not arbitrable. And Kevin gave some examples of the types of disputes that might you might not be able to submit to arbitration, such as, for example, family law disputes um, and secondly that recognition or enforcement of the award would be contrary to the public policy of the place where our enforcement is sought. All right thank you very much Fidelma thank you that was really helpful. Um, we'll now move to our third speaker and third topic. The third topic is arbitration costs and duration and I invite Brenda Horrigan uh, to speak to us Brenda is uh, Head of International Arbitration 
at Herbert Smith Freehills in, the, in their Sydney office. She's an Australian registered lawyer, but admitted in Washington, D.C. So she um, practiced, can practice in both jurisdictions. She's tw- she has 20 years of experience in international arbitration and works in all facets of, of this area. Uh, and she currently serves as the president of the Australian Centre for International Arbitration. Uh, for those of you in the audience who are from the Pacific Islands, Brenda has visited many of our islands and has enjoyed scuba diving there. So uh, I'd like to invite Brenda now to speak to us. Bula Brendan, uh, Brenda, and welcome. Thanks, John. I'm actually an Australian registered foreign lawyer, so um, I can't ah. practice Australian law. But just oh, to make sorry, that clear. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Sorry. <laughs> No problem at all. Um, welcome, everyone. I thought I would start, I'm, I'm going to focus on uh, cost and duration of proceedings, but I thought I'd set the stage really by going back to the question or, or, or to the concept of how arbitration came to be. Um, it's really a melding of common law approaches and civil law approaches. And those approaches are very different in style, in in timing, uh, and in the processes that are applied. Just to give an example, I once had uh, two cases with identical underlying issues, identical facts, identical legal issues, and involving two um, copies of an identical plane. So one was in Canada, a civil or common law jurisdiction, and one was in Belgium, a civil law jurisdiction. Exactly the same underlying arguments and issues. In Canada, we were in court for a month because a lot of the testimony was given through witness evidence. In Belgium, we were in court for four hours because most of the evidence uh, came in through documentary submissions and pleadings. um, And we didn't have witness testimony. So those two styles are obviously very different. They result in different timings and approaches. Arbitration is a melding of the two. So you wind up with some limited witness testimony, but much shorter than you would find in a common law jurisdiction. You find a greater reliance on documentary submissions, But you also have limited document production in arbitration that you wouldn't find in most civil jurisdictions, but not nearly to the extent that you would find in a common law jurisdiction. So when we look at duration and cost, we can't automatically assume that arbitration will necessarily be faster and cheaper than litigation, because it may not be faster and cheaper than litigation in some civil law jurisdictions. It is faster and cheaper, usually, even in those jurisdictions, when you take into account the fact that you don't have appeals uh, in arbitration, and you do in most civil law jurisdictions. So we can't automatically assume that it's faster and cheaper, but we can automatically assume that it's going to be enforceable. And that's, that's the key point. So once we're starting from that standpoint, how do we ensure that whatever process we're in is as fast and efficient uh, as fits the specific case. And actually, since this is the session uh, for business people, there is a lot that the corporate parties can do throughout the process to make sure that the process and the duration and the cost is within their expectations. And that starts from the very beginning, from the the drafting of the clause. As Kevin was saying, um, that is often something that happens at midnight. Um, When I was a baby lawyer, I was a transactional lawyer, and we would sit there at five o'clock in the morning and we'd be kind of, oh, arbitration clause. Okay, well, just, just use the one from the last transaction. That is a perfect way to add hundreds of thousands of dollars of costs to your arbitration and months, if not more, to the duration of your arbitration, because inevitably you will get something wrong in that 5 a.m. clause. Um, And it can be something so simple as one of the examples that's come across my desk, bilingual contract, um, 
in one language, the placement of the comma meant that you had to wait 60 days before you could go to arbitration. In the other language, the placement of the comma meant that you had to go to arbitration within 60 days or you lost jurisdiction. Both languages were equally applicable. They were completely incompatible. We fought about this issue during the arbitration on challenges to jurisdiction, on an application to set aside the award, and on enforcement in five jurisdictions. It's affectionately known as the case of the $45 million comma. Other things that can happen, um, Fidelma mentioned um, inclusion of requirements as to the qualifications of the arbitrators. Those can be fine as long as you're careful with them. Where you get into trouble is when you have overlapping qualification requirements or you have um, qualification requirements that are fuzzy or too strict. If you say that your arbitrator has to be a nuclear physicist who's fluent in Swahili, you're going to have a problem finding someone. If you say that you want an arbitrator who's not a citizen of the EU or China, but is Hong Kong qualified and is fluent in English and Mandarin and is on the CTAC panel of arbitrators, I can tell you there are five people in the world that meet that requirement because that was one of the clauses that we had to deal with. So again, a big jurisdictional challenge that could have been avoided had the parties been very careful uh, with the drafting of their clause. So there's a lot that you can do at the front end to make sure that your arbitration runs smoothly. And the more that you do to make sure that your arbitration runs smoothly, the more likely you are to be able to have an efficient process that is lower cost and shorter in duration. Once you have the clause in, in the contract and you're moving to the, the next phase, uh, you get into a dispute, how you document that dispute can also have an impact on the cost and duration of your uh, arbitration should you ultimately wind up in arbitration. Things like if you have a requirement to mediate before you go to arbitration? Have you met that requirement? Otherwise, you're going to have a jurisdictional uh, challenge around whether uh, you have standing to bring the arbitration. If you have a requirement um, of certain notices being given, have those been properly done? Have they been properly documented? Has the company ensured that it's kept the records that it needs to prove the elements of its claim or its defense, as the case may be. So the document retention policies that the company has in the process leading up to the dispute and the arbitration can have a big impact on how that arbitration actually runs. And again, there are very distinct differences between uh, the backgrounds of corporates in different jurisdictions. So while a U.S. corporate may be very familiar with document retention policies because they are constantly subject to po possible suit, a company in a civil law jurisdiction that doesn't have a lot of international experience may not have that same inherent kind of automatic process of having document retention policies. And it may keep things that it perhaps shouldn't have kept, or it may not keep things that it should have kept. Um, it's very common in many uh, civil law jurisdictions, for example, when, a, when, a, uh, when an employee leaves a company, for the company to wipe that employee's laptop. Well, there go all the documents that you could have used in proving your case in the arbitration. That that means that you have to go through increased document um, production exercises in order to try and find the documents that had you had document management processes in place, you would have had um, probably in your own files. Once you get into the arbitration itself, one of the key uh, factors that corporates can do uh, to ensure that um, things run as smoothly as possible is the selection of the arbitrator. Um, you want an arbitrator who will give proper time and attention to your case. Um, if you get an arbitrator who is too busy, um, is not proactive, is 
otherwise distracted, that will mean that your arbitration takes longer. And as Kevin was mentioning, it, there's kind of a direct correlation between how long something takes and how expensive it is. Because the, the fact of life for lawyers is, well, most of us, um, we expand the work to fit the time. So if you give us three, three months to do something, it'll be done in three months. If you give us nine months to do something, it's going to take us nine months, and that's more expensive. So you don't want to set artificial deadlines, but you want to ensure that the arbitrator is pushing the parties forward at a reasonable pace. The arbitrator should be proactive in terms of putting in place an early procedural order that um, implements international best practice, that, that, that directs the parties to take steps that will shorten the proceedings and lead to a better result. Parties, corporates often say that they want a proceeding that is fast and cheap until they get into the proceeding itself. And then the corporate says, oh, but no, actually, I want to prove, I want to turn over every leaf and make sure that I prove everything in my case and then some because if I leave anything out, I might lose. So the corporates also have to be disciplined about identifying what is directly relevant to their case, what is material to the outcome of the case, and focusing on those issues and not going off on expensive tangents. Then you get to um, the actual argumentation, the, 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 the hearing, um, the submissions uh, leading up to the hearing and the hearing itself. Often where you get, often where proceedings derail or get delayed or get more expensive is where the lawyers that are brought in to handle the arbitration are not internationally experienced or not um, cognizant of the fact that arbitration and litigation are and should be different. The beauty of arbitration is the ability to establish your own procedure and your own rules and ways of making the arbitration run. If you automatically default back to a litigation style approach with all of the litigation heavy rules and requirements, you're adding time and expense that you didn't need to add um, had you focused on the the best practice of of how the arbitration could run efficiently um, so all of these um, play in in affecting uh, the expense and the duration of the arbitration. Then you get to the award, and hopefully your arbitrator drafts a good award. Um, some institutions, SEAC and the ICC, will review the award with varying degrees of uh, intensity to make sure that at least the issues are all covered off. Um, others rely on the arbitrators uh, to, to do that. But as long as your award is solidly drafted, um, you then move to the enforcement procedure. And depending on the um, recalcitrance of your counterparty, enforcement might be easy, it might be automatic, it might be uh, voluntary, or it might be very difficult. And this is another place where the corporates play a big role up front at the beginning of the transaction in ensuring that any ultimate award can be enforced. If you know that your counterparty is in a jurisdiction with questionable courts, and you know that your counterparty is likely to resist enforcement. There are things you can do at the beginning of the transaction, such as ring fencing assets in a country that um, does have a good enforcement record um, that will allow you greater leverage over your counterparty once you, once you have a dispute and once you have an award. I had an award um, recently against a, a state-owned enterprise in a Central Asian jurisdiction, um, which is, and that jurisdiction was among those 
at the bottom of the Transparency International list of good court systems. So it was clear that the courts of that jurisdiction were not going to be helpful in enforcing the award. But the client, the corporate, had at the outset of the transaction ring-fenced assets in a third country that did have a good enforcement record. And what wound up happening was that after we had the award, the party settled and there was voluntary payment because the counterparty knew that its assets in the third country were vulnerable. So again, there's a lot that the corporates can be doing to control this process. Don't leave it just to the lawyers, but take ownership of um, of the process as corporates. And I'll stop there and welcome any questions. Okay, thanks, um, Brenda. Uh, another another question from me. Um, you've mentioned international best practice in terms of establishing the procedures for the conduct of the arbitration. What types of measures would you include in that basket, that international best practice basket? Well, you would you would definitely want an early case management conference between the parties and uh, the arbitrators. You would want at that case management conference to ensure that the arbitrator uh, had a good understanding of what the parties think the dispute is about. You would probably set your timetable for the entire arbitration up front so that you put the parties on the hook and, and they know what's coming. Uh, you might set early um, discussions between experts um, so that rather than having expert reports that pass in the night, um, you the experts are all addressing uh, the same issues. You would have an early determination by the tribunal uh, together with the parties as to whether the submissions in the proceedings would be memorial style or pleading style so that, again, you didn't have differences in submissions um, that didn't really respond uh, to the other party's submission. Um, those are the, the those are a few examples, but there are many more. Okay. Well, what's the difference between memorial style and the others and pleading style for those um, of us who are not familiar with the technicalities? A memorial style is... Um, you attach all of the documents and evidence up front. You oh, yeah. um, describe the uh, all of the facts and circumstances leading to the dispute, but you also argue the facts and argue the law. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas a pleading style, you tend to have a, a more skeletal submission early on, and the evidence comes in later, and the argumentation on uh, fact and law comes later. I see. All right, there's uh, there's actually there's actually um, on the Akika website we have um, both a recorded webinar and, and a practice note on the distinction between um, pleadings and memorials, and I would encourage you all to take a look because it's a very useful uh, set of documents. Okay, great. One last question, if just for, if you've got a couple of minutes, are there any other measures that you would recommend the parties adopt? in an arbitration to help control time and cost? Because that's what uh, arbitration promises, um, less time, less cost. What sort of measures would you recommend? Well, again, I would, I would encourage um, parties, the corporates, um, to play an active role in the process, to work with their counsel early and upfront to identify what their actual goals are. Um, sometimes the corporate doesn't necessarily want to win everything. They just want to make a point or um, accomplish a narrow goal. And if the lawyer doesn't realize that going in and hasn't had that conversation with the client at the outset, the goals of the of of the council may be different from the goals of the of the company and so the the earlier and more thoroughly you can have those discussions um the more you can ensure that everybody is sorry we've lost you there I think I had lost you. Um, oh, it's basically um, to ensure that uh, that counsel and the client are speaking early and often to make sure that they're 
they each have a clear understanding of what the company's goals are so that everybody is working toward those goals and not adding extras. All right. Thank you so much, Brenda. Thank you for that. We'll now go to our next um, speaker, who's Kevin Lim. And Kevin will, uh, not Kevin, sorry, Jonathan, Johnny Lim. Um, And Johnny will talk to us about using international arbitration clauses for dispute resolution in a contract. A little bit of bio for Johnny. Johnny is a counsel at Wilma Hale in London. He focuses on complex international disputes representing governments and corporates in commercial and investment arbitrations under all international arbitration rules. And across, he's done that across the world. He um, has advised governments on a range of public international law issues and the drafting of arbitration um, legislation. He has a developing practice as an arbitrator, and he also teaches international arbitration at the National University of Singapore. Uh, Jonathan, although ostensibly based in London, is currently a COVID refugee in Singapore, um, which is his home, and he's been based there since March last year. Uh, Jonathan, over to you. Thank you, John. I tried to make that clear with my background, so I'm deep in the forest of Singapore, giving this wonderful presentation at this wonderful conference. I'm really glad to be here. Um, after hearing about all the benefits of arbitration from, from Fidelma and Kevin, um, you've decided to do an arbitration. How do you get there? Um, and before you even get to the arbitration process, what is this thing called an arbitration clause that all the speakers have been referring to? I'm going to talk a bit about the arbitration clause. Um, I understand that not all of you are lawyers, um, and arbitration clauses aren't really that complicated. My focus today will be less on sort of legalese, more on commercial considerations underlying some key choices that parties and corporate counsel need to make. Um, As Brenda says, there are many ways um, corporates can take ownership uh, over time and costs, take ownership over disputes that arise. And one way is to pay some attention to the drafting of the arbitration clause. So let me start with some general observations. The first is um, that and it flows from one of the key advantages of arbitration, um, is that the process is led very much by the needs of the of the users, corporates, the businesses who use arbitration. The legal framework in the arbitration legislation that exists gives primacy to what the parties want. And so parties should take advantage of that by anticipating what they want as early as possible. I think Brenda's referred to this, Kevin's referred to this. Business people don't often think about dispute resolution clauses until disputes arise. Uh, We often call it the midnight clause um, because commercial lawyers only discuss them at the closing stages of negotiations. I think midnight is is quite charitable. I think as Brendan says, it's it's sometimes later than that. Um, Another reason it might be called the midnight clause is because complications that arise from badly drafted clause also keep up parties and their lawyers way, 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 way past midnight. So um, anticipate what needs you might have uh, before a dispute arises and then build those needs into the arbitration agreement. That's one point. The other general consideration is that it's often best to keep the arbitration agreement simple. Uh, often we see uh, complicated arbitration agreements where parties' lawyers have tried to do too much with them. And, and and usually it's these complicated modifications to, I'm going to get into this, model clauses um, that institutions and other organizations publish. It's these modifications that actually give rise to problems. Because, um, and I'll get into this, institutions publish these things called model clauses that they put a lot of work into and they've thought about it and they've used these clauses in many cases. And there's a reason why they are the recommended model clause. I think if, in general, if you're going to go away from that clause, um, I think parties should think hard about it. And I'll expand a bit more on this later. 
The priority here really is to have a certain and predictable clause. Um, the other the other consideration parties might have is neutrality. I mean, obviously parties want to avoid getting caught up in unfamiliar courts where they may not enjoy the advantage. You want to have a neutral, predictable forum where you're going to have a fair fight. So those are the priorities, and in general, it is not worth risking certainty, predictability, neutrality to address other kinds of practice preferences. So those are some general considerations. I'm going to go through today a checklist of what I call critical elements and then a checklist of optional elements. Critical elements are points that I think it is important that parties, corporate counsel, think through uh, before agreeing to an arbitration clause. Um, there are critical points that parties should decide for themselves. Um, optional elements are things that parties can live without, and you don't have to always have them in an arbitration clause. Uh, they may be important to, to particular types of parties, specific sectors. Uh, for example, a specific provision on confidentiality. That can be particularly important to party involved in a dispute about industrial designs or parties in the pharmaceutical industry. But in general, you don't necessarily have to specify that in the clause because that can be something that's covered by the arbitration law of the seat, which I'll explain in a bit. Um, or it can be something covered by the institutional rules. It's something covered by the SIAC rules, for example, and rules of many other institutions. Um, and I'll get into that. But you don't always need to have a confidentiality clause in your contract. So that's what I call an optional element. Other optional elements I'll discuss are, are multi-tier dispute resolution clauses, um, provisions on disclosure, uh, provisions on fast-track arbitration, uh, and so on. What I call the critical elements are um, institution or ad hoc, what rules, the seat of the arbitration, language of the arbitration, arbitrators, uh, and choice of law. So I'm going to spend some time on each of these points. So one of the first choices parties might make is whether to choose institutional or ad hoc arbitration. Uh, Kevin spoke a bit about this, uh, but in general, institutional arbitration is arbitration administered by some non-governmental body, uh, usually an arbitral institution, who supervises the process. Um, I just want to make clear that the institution is not uh, the body or the party that resolves the dispute. Typically, it's a service provider that supervises the process, um, helps with the selection of arbitrators, acts as a repository, helps to arrange the logistics of a hearing, deals with deposits and fees. It does all the things um, that really elevate the experience to make it more of a, if I may, business class experience. But um, it's not the institution is not the party deciding the dispute. So arbitral institutions administer, but they do not decide disputes. Um, why might you choose an institution? Um, just some commercial considerations here for parties to consider. Um, often institutional rules and institutions play some part in, in helping to manage a case. So that generally reduces the risk of, of procedural deadlocks or breakdowns in the process. Um, processes like scrutiny of the final award that Brenda referred to that ICC and SIAP do, um, in general, would reduce the likelihood that there are technical defects in, in the arbitral award. So the institution manages the process more to ensure that you have more predictability and certainty. Um, institutional rules also um, provide default rules and a framework on important issues like the appointment of arbitrators, challenges to arbitrators, how the fees of the arbitrators are to be determined, and parties then have upfront knowledge and certainty about those items. Um, institutions may also have some add-ons. I think um, some of the speakers have referred to expedited procedures, provisions on joinder and consolidation. Institutional rules offer that, and often ad hoc arbitration rules do not. At the same time, parties, you know, have a choice, and it's a real choice. There may be reasons to choose ad hoc arbitration. 
can be more flexible, can be more readily customized to the party's needs. They don't have to accept what an institution is asking them to do if they would prefer and agree to do otherwise. Um, it can be less expensive, um, um, but in general, ad hoc arbitrations um, will have less of the um, case management benefits um, that come with an institution. And, and in general, I think our recommendation is, is an institution generally would be a bit safer uh, unless parties are experienced and have, have experience of arbitration disputes, in which case they can specify what they want in advance with a lot more specificity. So it comes back to what is important for the parties. Do you want a defined process with help in the legal framework and the business class services? And you pay a fee for that, but it's not a very big fee for the business class services. Or do you want a relatively flexible, less formalized process? So that's one of the first choices that you have to make, institutional or ad hoc. Then there's the choice of institution. Uh, if parties decide that they want to use an arbitral institution, um, there's a question of which institution. In general, I would say the main considerations are neutrality, uh, track record, cost, and proximity. If you're in the Pacific region, for example, it may not make sense to go to an institution in Paris, uh, New York, or in Chile. Um, and in particular, since there are a number of very good arbitral institutions in the region uh, near to you. Uh, besides the institution Kevin represents, SIEC, SIAC, which is generally regarded as the gold standard for, for commercial arbitration institutions, um, there are many very good institutions in the region as well, Akiko in Australia, and Zayak in, in New Zealand, Amin in New Zealand. Uh, so that's the first element, institutional or ad hoc. Um, the second element I'll speak to is scope. So it's important to specify in your arbitration agreement what kinds of disputes are covered by it. The, and just give me a second. My, I'm having a technical issue with my computer, which I'm trying to resolve concurrently, but I think that might not be so wise. Okay, I'm back. So the second element is, is scope. Um, the scope of the arbitration agreement, just, just so you have some idea, is a clause that says, you know, any disputes, claims, or controversies arising out of or in relation to the contract, to the current contract, including any question as to its existence, validity, and performance, so on. That kind of clause, that, that part of the arbitration clause addresses its scope. And the key objective here for parties is to ensure that all the disputes that you want to go to arbitration are clearly specified as going to arbitration. And you really want to avoid the situation where some disputes go to an arbitrator and other closely related disputes go, for example, to a court. And then there's a dispute about jurisdiction. Uh, and may also be more costly and complex um, to have multiple decision makers decide effectively the same dispute. Um, maybe one court decides a tort claim and the arbitral tribunal decides the contract claim, uh, that could create the risk of inconsistent decisions. It also multiplies costs for parties. So parties should think clearly about where they want the disputes to be resolved, but also what kinds of disputes and which disputes go where. Uh, in general, our recommendation is to have everything in one place. I mean, there are, of course, exceptions and parties are free to customize this uh, to their needs. Um, but some questions that might help guide that process, um, should the scope be broad or narrow? Uh, should I cover tort claims in, in the clause? Uh, if there are multiple parties, how do I ensure that they are also part of this arbitration process? Um, if there are interrelated agreements, multiple agreements here, are all the relevant agreements going to be covered by the same arbitration clause? Uh, do they have consistent and compatible arbitration clauses? Those kinds of questions uh, go to the scope of the arbitration. Um, the third element I'll speak to briefly is the seat, I think, which is something Kevin has spoken about as well. It's the legal home of the arbitration. The courts at the seat will um, supervise the process and intervene when necessary to enforce arbitration agreements uh, or to annul or set aside arbitral awards uh, subject to specific limited grounds. Uh, the law of the seat also provides some basic standards for fairness in the conduct of proceedings. Um, 
and also in general provides the procedural law of the of the arbitration. It provides a framework uh, in, in which the arbitrators operate. So again, the important considerations for parties are um, predictability, track record, and neutrality. Uh, and for these reasons, I often say there isn't a best seat necessarily, but a basket of, of safe and good seats. Some key considerations for deciding whether a seat is safe. Uh, generally, you want a country that has implemented the New York Convention. Um, now you have 167 countries to choose from. And then you also want a national law that is hospitable to and supportive of international arbitration, uh, supportive of the enforceability of arbitral uh, awards and arbitration agreements, provides for the freedom of parties to choose arbitrators, minimal judicial interference. This is what I mean by track record. You want a seat that has um, been proven to be a safe and good seat that has a track record of dealing with arbitrations and enforcing arbitration agreements and arbitral awards. And secondary to that, there are considerations. Yeah, please, John. Round up, Johnny, please. Yeah. Sorry. Absolutely. Just about to run up. The... The, the, the other considerations you might think about for a seat are, you know, that's usually the place where the arbitrators then have the hearing. And that's not often the case, um, uh, not often necessarily the case. Arbitrators can have the hearing anywhere. But you might want to think about logistics of getting witnesses to the seat. Those are also important considerations, uh, you know, if the hearing is held there. And so that's the seat. Uh, the fifth thing I'll just speak to as a critical element is the appointment of arbitrators. And I'll wrap up after this point. Uh, you know, it's 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 no, I think, exaggeration to say that the process of arbitration is is only as good as the arbitrators. Uh, but in your clause, you don't have to choose your arbitrator. Um, you don't have to specify, you know, I want Kevin Nash to decide my dispute, right? Whatever dispute arises under this production sharing contract, I want this person to decide it. Often, the arbitration clause provides um, on two things. It provides for the number of arbitrators. And it provides for a procedure to appoint the arbitrators, right? So those are two things that parties should think about. In general, unless the dispute's quite small, it's preferable to have three arbitrators. Um, and in general, institutional rules, if you choose them, will provide default rules for appointing arbitrators. So that's not something you have to specify if you've got a set of arbitration rules, either institutional or institutional. Um, that you've chosen, which will have a procedure for appointing the arbitrator. So you don't have to then specify that again in your clause. Uh, one last point, I think just to pick up on something Fidelma said, I think it's part of parties' choice and freedom that they can consider specifying in their clause certain attributes they want to have from arbitrators. Um, that can be really helpful, especially if you're in a specialized industry like oil and gas and you want in this arbitrators for a certain qualification or a certain profile. Uh, but in our experience, parties should also think carefully before they do something like that, because they may limit the ability of parties to select the right person once the dispute has arisen. Because once the dispute has arisen, you might realize that it's not actually a technical dispute. Maybe it's really a contract law dispute. And you really wanted someone who was, you know, an English law expert rather than someone who was an oil and gas expert. Um, also, it might lead to disputes between the parties. Once the dispute has arisen, parties might debate whether someone qualifies under the arbitration clause's stipulation of, you know, well-qualified and experienced. So if you want to specify in your clause the criteria your arbitrator should meet, um, it needs to be very objective and clear. And that's not often easy to do. And for that reason, we would recommend uh, proceeding with caution. Uh, so, so those are some critical elements um, of an arbitration clause that parties should think about when drafting them. Um, there are often things that a model clause like the one provided by SIAC or ICC will ask you to think about already. So I think, again, I would go back to the point I started with, which is start with the model clause. And in most cases, um, you don't really need to go further than the model clause. Okay. Thank you, Johnny. We have three minutes left and we have one question, um, and maybe I'll direct this to you, Kevin. It's a question from Hamish Clark. It's, do you envisage that virtual or remote hearings will become the default choice of the parties in the arbitration clause? Yeah, the question is whether you want to give effect to that in an arbitration clause. So you have to look at the set of institutional rules uh, in your arbitra arbitration clause, say, 
uh, LCIA has now included express provisions on remote hearings. At SIC, we're actually quite advantaged because the tribunal has very broad powers. But looking forward and doing a little bit of crystal ball gazing, I think probably everyone agrees that in the standard case, there will never be that case management conference that Brenda was discussing, where everybody is flying from all corners of the world. I think that we're going to see more of a hybrid mechanism where you have to evaluate the particular dispute. Is there uh, evidence that really needs an in-person hearing, or can this be decided remotely? The way arbitration has adapted and come together on this issue has really been remarkable. Uh, you have all of the institutions working together, new technologies uh, being developed, and it's actually ha helping us get to what we want in arbitration. Fast, cost-effective, global, and it's all working very well. All right. Thank you very much. We've got only a minute left, and at the end of the minute and 45 seconds, we'll all be ejected. So, uh, Jonathan, do you want to add something to that answer in the, in the last minute? Yeah, I mean, just adding to what Kevin said, I think we are certainly seeing a lot more uh, virtual hearings. Um, I think the questioner had in mind um, the question, are these going to be the default? Is that going to be the norm? Is that the new normal? Uh, are all hearings going to be virtual uh, unless there's an exceptional circumstance that justifies it? I think the reality is probably going to be closer to what Kevin spelt out. I think it's going to be a hybrid. It's going to be a decision in each case what's best for the parties. I think parties are now realizing that they don't have to be all be in the same room in order to have a hearing. Uh, but often, I think, through the experience of actually doing a virtual hearing, I think um, we've also realized that something is lost, I think, when you don't meet face to face. So I think it's a, a matter of sort of weighing those pros and cons in the context of a particular dispute and deciding whether the expense of all flying to the same place in The Hague or Singapore justifies um, doing that. All right. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very, very much to all four of our speakers and to the audience. And I hope you all found this useful. Thank you.